amongst my people, we say that when two Chitauri are challenging each other for power, and they must fight a duel with their terrible eyes, they start glowing like fishes deep in the, in the sea, and the faster they glow, the angrier they, they, they are said to be. Now that is why there are certain parts of Africa where people are advised not to walk at night because that is where the Chitauri often fight. And one of these parts of Africa, sir, is a remarkable place called the Mountains of the Round Rocks, Matobo, wrongly pronounced Matopo in, in Zimbabwe. These hills are really not remarkable in themselves. These hills are, are said to be the one place in Africa where the Chitauri have been seen. And these hills say, is where Cecil John Rhodes lies buried, but there is more. You must visit this place at one time. Amongst the rocks on the Matopo Mountains, you find a species of lizard which you don't find anywhere in Africa or the world. A species of lizard which responds to the call of a human being. When I first arrived in 1958 in the land called Rhodesia, now known as Zimbabwe, I found an African there who was a tourist attraction. He was a game warden who made strange sounds calling out and as he called out these strange lizards the only type of lizard anywhere on earth which responds to to the human voice used to come out of cracks and out of holes in the ground and to gather around this African and it was this African game warden who told me that the, sh the sounds he is making are not just noise, they are the speech of the Chitauri star goals. Isn't it a staggering coincidence that Cecil Rhodes, one of the greatest Illuminati frontmen, uh, perhaps of, 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 of certainly of modern times, who did so much to imprison Africa, should choose to be buried at the point where this is all going on. You see, sir, Cecil John Rhodes went his way into the hearts of Africans, and in their despair, wise men of the Mashona people, wise men of Matebele people, tried to make Cecil John Rhodes one of them. They told him about the secrets of the Matopo Mountains, that under the Matopo Mountains lies a city, a city of great wisdom, which is the home of the last survivors of the Chitauri god beings in that part of Africa. And if you go to the Matopo Mountains and you carry a four pound hammer and you strike certain parts of that landscape with that hammer, it gives out a hollow sound which shows you that there are caverns deep underground. There are two sets of mountains. There is the Matopo Mountains, and then to the east of Zimbabwe, there are the great mountains known as the Inyangani, the Weeping Moon Mountains. There, even now, people disappear without trace. Sometimes a person would disappear for several days and reappear a few days later, not knowing where he had been or where she had been. 
and white people have disappeared there. Black people in their thousands have disappeared there. It was there that I also went missing for four days in 1959 in one of the most traumatic experiences of life. It's a long story, sir. My teacher, Elizabeth Moyo, had sent me to get a special herb which grows only on the foothills of those mountains. It was just an ordinary day like any other, just a beautiful day like this one outside here. And I, I love the African wilderness. I'm at home in the bush, especially in the days when I was still in good health. I love the animals, I, still, I love the, their smell, and I love the smell of the vegetation. And I was looking for this herb when all of a sudden a, a bright blue mist fell all around me. It took me some time to react to the strange thing. It was a hot day and all of a sudden the temperature around me dropped. It was as if I was on the slope of a very cold mountain. But it was a warm day. And then the next moment I was in what appeared to be a metal lined tunnel, a curving tunnel. And I was lying on what looked like a workbench, a very large uh, workbench of some kind. You know, a, an iron table which uh, uh, an engineer or somebody working with metal would use to, uh, for welding and cutting metal upon. But this workbench was very brightly polished. And there I was lying there with my trousers missing and only my khaki shirt, when I saw again through what appeared to be like blue mist, a number of moving objects, which at first I thought were dolls, and these objects were moving towards me. I noticed to, with mild surprise that they were very thin, short, human-like creatures with very, very large melon-shaped heads. The creatures had no noses, they, like hum as human beings have. They had only small little holes on either side of where the nose would be, and their mouths were like knife cuts at the bottom of their faces. And these creatures were coming towards me. In color, they were gray like certain uh, types of fish. And they wore silvery gray garments which reached up to their necks and up to their wrists. I couldn't see whether they were wearing boots or not at that time. And while I was looking at these creatures, I suddenly was aware that something was above me, standing there, and I looked up straight into the face of one of them, a much taller one than the others. And this creature was wearing a garment, like a tight-fitting overall, without any buttons or anything, which reached up to its neck, but its wrists were bare. I noticed that the creature said, had very long fingers. Its fingers had extra, and each of its fingers had an extra joint, and it ended in a claw, a black claw like that of a a chicken or a certain kind of bird, and that its thumb was not here, but here in the middle of the hand. And this thing was standing above my head and looking down at me, and I was looking at its eyes, 
which were very strange indeed. It was as if it was wearing plastic goggles over its eyes. I could see its eyes inside these tinted goggles and it had holes on either side here but it had no nose as I had. Its jaws were very small and its mouth was a slit with tiny little scale-like things where its lips should be. And the creature carried a horrible smell on its own. I can't describe that smell. It was a metallic chemical smell like, which seemed to combine the smell you would smell when somebody is burning brass or copper and a very ugly chemical smell, these two smells combined. And this creature was looking down at me. I was frightened, but I could not move. And the next thing I knew was a terrible pain on my left thigh. It was as if somebody had just stepped me right to the bone. I screamed and I tried to jump away, but my body was my body was inactive. I could not move. I was not tied to any chain. I was not chained to the top of this table. There was no belt tying me, but I could not move my body. And when I looked down at what was happening, I found that one of the shorter creatures had driven something very painful into my left thigh. And then, while I watched, horrified, the creature pulled out this thing, and I saw that it was like a pencil made of shining metal with what appeared to be a flexible uh, uh, cable at the back and before I could do anything sir, my head was seized by the creature above me it caught me on either side of the head like like this and then a fourth a second third creature drove something into my right nostril here it was as if I had been shocked. The pain was so terrible that I screamed and screamed. Blood filled my mouth. Blood spattered out of the nostril. And the creature did not seem to care. I was, I was stupefied. The pain was so intense, so terrible. And then, quietly, brutally, the creature pulled out the thing that it had stepped in, in me in the nose with, and blood flowed into my mouth, into, 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 out of my nostril, and I was choking. And then the big creature coldly turned my head this way, so that blood came out of the mouth and which gave me some kind of relief. And after what seemed like an eternity of pain, the, the creature brought something out of somewhere, which looked, it looked like a, an old-fashioned tea strain I could hear.
still amazed. After the creature had pulled out the flexible cable from my organ, the creature just stood there looking at my organ. And I was so terrified that I urinated and accidentally urinated against the chest of the creature. It jumped away as if I had shot it and it stumbled backwards. It but its face didn't show any expression. Its mouth didn't even open, but the way the creature reacted, trembling all over, it was as if I had really hit it, but it was wearing this kind of garment. And after that, sir, I was left alone, except for the big creature, which stood to one to my right side this time, with his arms folded, looking down at me. And then, while I was looking at this creature, trying to appeal to it, no pain anymore, no pain, please, I was pleading. Pictures suddenly flooded my mind. Pictures of buildings sunk in a red, in a red lake of, of water buildings rotting away, buildings that appeared as if they had been bombed, and cities sunk in terrible mud, trees sticking out like rotten ghosts, trees without leaves, without branches, sticking out of the mud as if they had been poisoned. I saw visions of this, and then through an entrance which I had not seen before, came a strange and terrible being. It was exactly like this. It was tall, made entirely of metal, with burning eyes and a snout. It didn't do anything. It just moved and came to stand at my left side. It didn't touch me or anything like that. It just stood there, making a strange humming sound. Wow, 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 like that. And then, from behind this metal creature, there appeared another creature. It was so radically different from the great creatures in that it looked exactly like an earthly human being. It had a pink skin like that of an, a, a white woman. It had golden hair and its ears were definitely pointed like those of an animal. Its eyes were slightly slanting. They were pale, pale blue, and never once did they blink. It was like this, mute, and there was a tail-like appendage at its head. 